So there's a kind of phase synchrony that can arise transiently and then fall apart and then arise again, and that this synchrony is a, is a, may perhaps be a kind of glue for this large-scale integration. One um, hypothesis that's being put forward is that this kind of transient long-distance synchrony, long-distance means over widely separated areas, is that this kind of transient long-distance synchrony is actually a correlate of conscious mental activity. So here we have, um, as seen in EEG, we have oscillatory activity being recorded at electrodes within a certain window. There is a fa there's a constant phase relationship or a phase synchrony, and this has been associated, say, in the fast gamma frequency range with things like um, attention, working memory, um, the binding of perceptual attributes. So the idea is that this kind of synchrony is a way of orchestrating and holding things together within a certain window of time. Okay, so this brings me then to the study, which some of you may be familiar with, which looked at now long-term uh, practitioners in uh, particular Tibetan Buddhist traditions, and it looked at the patterns of synchrony within the frequency range known as the gamma frequency range. This is around 25 to 42 hertz or cycles a second, so it's a fast frequency that we know to be associated with various aspects of waking and alert mental or, or cognitive activity, things like attention and working memory and so on. What this study did is it contrasted a neutral state, a non-meditative state, with a meditation meditative state, a particular type of meditation that I won't try to describe, that Alan could describe for you, that involves a, an open awareness infused with a, with a sense or feeling, the affect of compassion, so-called non-referential compassion meditation. So it looked at the contrast between a non-meditative state and the generation of this meditative state in long-term practitioners, individuals with many, many years of practice, many and a number of retreats, compared with novices who had um, a week of training uh, before the experiment in this, in this type of meditation. And there were a number of results, but I'll just mention the main one, and that is that in the long-term meditators, what you see are very, very high power or high amplitude oscillations in this gamma frequency range. So if this is the, the resting state and the meditative state, and so these are the signals, um, the bursts at the electrodes, so these fast frequency, high power um, gamma signals. And they're also temporally coordinated, that is the, the oscillations within a certain window are in phase, exhibit phase synchrony. So here you see the, um, the increase in the amplitude of the, of the gamma, and here you see the increase in the um, synchrony. This characterizes the EEG for the long-term practitioners, but not for the novices. Now, given that we already know that um, gamma is significant, gamma activity and gamma phase synchrony is significant in relation to things like working memory, um, attention, perceptual binding, and so on, that in general terms, it's, it's an it's, it's a index, you could say, I suppose, of um, coherent mental activity. What we see then is that, among other things, this type of meditative state is a highly organized and coherent state from the point of view of EEG. So this is, this is a way in which we see the large-scale integration happening in a way that's completely internally or endogenously generated. There's no, there's no perceptual stimulus. It's not, um, it's not under the um, outside control of the experimenter. It's rather generated from within and self-organized from the, from the cognitive neuroscience point of view. So it's a highly coherent and organized state that shapes neural activity. And that's going to lead in then to this notion of emergence. OK. How am I doing for time? I lose time, sense of time completely when I do these things. Five minutes? OK, I think I can, I think I can try and whip through this. OK, so um, this is the last thing I want to talk about, the notion of emergence and its relationship to um, volition. OK. Kinds of mental states that we've been talking about, or that I've been talking about here. It's important to remember that these mental states are self-generated. 
by that I mean they are intentionally enacted, intentionally uh, brought about. They arise from within, they're not... hold neural activity in place over a certain period of time. So how can we conceptualize this? How can we, how can we think about this kind of um, dynamical phenomenon? Well, let's go back to what I said at the beginning about not looking directly at brain activity and, and not getting direct readouts of subjective experience. I said we work with representations, interventions, and interpretations from multiple perspectives. And I want to stress the intervention, and you'll see why in a moment. Here's a speculation. The intentional enactment, or we could say the volitional generation of mental states that we see strikingly in the case of, of meditation, is a first person way of cognitively intervening in the workings of one's brain at the level of large scale dynamical activity. So I want to try and conceptualize what we're talking about in terms of a, of a kind of notion of what philosophers would call an interventionist causation. And I'll say some more about that in a moment. In the context of neural dynamics, there are models that propose that intention can be thought of as a kind of um, large scale pattern, what's known as an order parameter. This is, a, this is a collective variable in the sense that it's a variable whose values are set by the parameter of the system's dynamic. It's a collective variable that constrains the system's behavior by stabilizing or destabilizing it. So here's a sort of take-home way you can think of this in your own case. You're all familiar with this image. You look at it and it spontaneously shifts in depth. That's a kind of moment of stability, a destabilization, and a reconfiguration into a new pattern. Nothing out there is changing. This is arising from within. It arises, as far as we know, stochastically. It flips back and forth stochastically. But, interesting, you can also make it flip yourself. You can voluntarily induce the flip. So, for example, if you focus your attention here, and you, as it were, mentally imagine pulling that towards you, you can get the cube to flip. So this is an example of a, of a voluntary mental switching, or an intentionally enacted mental switching, that makes something out there look different. It changes how the world appears, but nothing out there in the world is changing. Now, I want to relate this to something that's similar, that is a paradigm in neuroscience that is used to look at consciousness and attention called binocular rivalry. Briefly, in binocular rivalry, you take two different images. These are, you can't really see, but these are uh, vertical lines and horizontal lines. You present each image, one to, you present one image to each eye with a certain setup. And what happens is, um, rather than fusing, the images will um, compete with each other for perceptual dominance. So you'll see um, a kind of patchwork, and then you'll see the horizontal lines, and the vertical will be suppressed, and then you'll see the vertical, and the horizontal lines will be suppressed. We know, this takes a moment to load, because it's, we know that when this happens, so this corresponds to a moment of perceptual dominance, another moment of perceptual dominance, another moment of perceptual dominance, that when this happens, in the moment of perceptual dominance, we see these widespread patterns of synchrony. So when the image emerges, there's a particular pattern of synchrony in the brain, that synchrony pattern falls apart, the image emerges again, there's a new pattern of synchrony. So this is a, a large-scale, dynamical um, event in the brain. Now, interestingly, there was a study that was done that looked at um, binocular rivalry in long-term Tibetan Buddhist uh, monks, practitioners, in the context of a focused attention meditation by comparison with other types of meditation. In the focused attention meditation where you stabilize your attention single-pointedly on an object, when these individuals were in this meditative state and after they were in it, when they were presented with the binocular uh, rivalry Oh my god. Why it's doing that? <laughs> 